We're asking the question, who is God and what is God like? And now we're going to turn to the book of Exodus, to chapter 20, a familiar text. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God will give you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor shall you covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or female servant, or his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Throughout the Bible, the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, as they are often called, are celebrated as a gift of grace, a gift of God's grace. Old Testament scholar Gerhard von Rott puts it this way. God declaring the Ten Commandments, God speaking the Ten Words, is celebrated as a saving act of the first order. <laughs> Imagine that. People celebrating with joy because someone interrupted their life by speaking the law. <laughs> Why? Why would anyone celebrate the giving of the law? Because the living God is the God who frees. And the living God speaks the Ten Commandments to protect and enhance freedom. God had rescued the Hebrew slaves from and for, from bondage and oppression, for relationship with Yahweh and with each other. That's how it always is with God. God frees us from to free us for. God frees us from slavery of all kinds for relationship, for intimacy, for wholeness. From the top of a mountain, ablaze with fire, shrouded in smoke, the living and holy God declares, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of slavery. And then from the mountaintop speaks 10 words in order to protect and enhance that freedom. How do Yahweh's commandments protect and enhance freedom? Because they fit the species, which is why, until recently, they held such a central place in Western civilization. Even those who did not affirm the divine origin of these commandments held them in high regard because there's something about them that fits the human species. Why? For one simple reason, Yahweh knows what makes us tick. The lawgiver is not only the redeemer, the lawgiver is also the creator. This is critical to realize and affirm. The giver of the law is the one who made us. Yahweh drew up the blueprints of the human species. Yahweh is the one who designed us as magnificently complex creatures. And in the Ten Commandments, the Creator tells us how we humans best function in the created order. You can see then that to ignore or go against Yahweh's law is to go against the grain of our essential nature. When we violate God's good law, we violate reality. It goes still deeper. 
For Yahweh did not, so to speak, spin the law out of thin air. The commandments emerge out of Yahweh's nature and character. The commandments reveal God's nature and character. So in the law, God is giving us, if you will, his own self-portrait. You shall not bear false witness. Why? Because I, your God, will not. I'm utterly reliable. I mean what I say, and I say what I mean. You shall not commit adultery. Why? Because I, the Lord, your God, will not commit adultery. I'm utterly faithful. I keep my commandments. I protect my relationships. The Hebrew word for law is the word Torah. The noun comes from the verb, which means to shoot, to throw, to teach and thus to reveal. As one scholar put it, when one man teaches another, he shoots ideas from his own mind into another's mind, but in so doing, he reveals what is on his mind. When Yahweh threw his commandments to us, he shot ideas from his own heart and mind into our heart and mind, thus revealing what is on his heart and mind. This is why in Psalm 1, 19 and 119, the psalmist speaks of loving the law. <laughs> loving the law? I mean, is he nuts? No. The psalmist loves the Torah because in it and through it, God has made himself known. The psalmist loves the law because he loves the giver of the law who is revealed in the law. The first three commandments... <laughs> Protect and enhance relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. These three commandments free us by warning us of our capacity for idolatry. Idolatry always destroys life. For we were not only made by the living God, we were made for the living God. And, and if we allow any other God, however good, to become come between us and the living God, we're going to lose. Yahweh alone can fulfill our deepest longings. And for our sake, he calls us to exclusive allegiance. That's why he says, I'm the jealous God, the God who passionately desires relationship and will tolerate no false lovers. And for our sake, God forbids our making any likeness of the divine. For in the words of Alan Cole, no likeness could possibly be adequate, and each type of image would imprint its own misunderstanding of God on our hearts. God wants us to know God as God really is. As Joy Davidman said, the first three commandments free us from little gods for the one true living God. The fourth commandment protects and enhances a balanced life. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Here, God sets us free from rat raceness, for human raceness. Freedom, not to mention effectiveness, is found in this six plus one rhythm. Then commandments five through nine protect and enhance our relationship with the community. God begins with the relationship closest to us, with parents. So commandment five, you shall honor your father and mother. Honor means more than obey. It means to highly praise. It means to have respect for. It means to take care of. And the fifth commandment is given to protect us in our old age, to safeguard a place for the aged within the community. Commandment six, you shall not murder, safeguards our neighbor's physical life. Commandment seven, you shall not commit adultery, safeguards our neighbor's marriage. Commandment eight, you shall not steal, safeguards our neighbor's property. And commandment nine, you shall not bear false witness, safeguards our neighbor's reputation. The key commandment that protects and enhances a life of freedom is the 10th. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant or his ox or donkey or his new Lexus or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here, God frees us from ourselves. God frees us by warning us about our hearts telling us that our hearts have this capacity to crave what is not our own. <laughs> oh, that's putting it mildly. Here God calls us to examine and check our unspoken desires and yearnings. For if I crave my neighbor's wife long enough, the desire will give birth to fantasizing, which will one day lead to action. 
If I crave my neighbor's status long enough, the desire will cause me to either usurp her position by force or will her down by spreading rumors. The living God wants us to live and so protects us against our sin while it is still in an embryonic form. Now, if God's law is describing the freedom life, if God's law reveals who God is and who God made us to be, and if we keep failing to keep the law, then we're in an awful bind. Is there a way out? Yes, there is. And the way out is Jesus. In Hebrew, his name is Yeshua, meaning Yahweh to the rescue. The lawgiver comes down from the top of the mountain, all the way down, 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 and becomes one of us. And as one of us born under the law, frees us to live the life of freedom. How? Not by discarding the law, not by watering it down to fit our circumstances. That was the error of liberalism. Not by rubbing it in our face, not by beating us over the head with it. That's the error of fundamentalism. Instead, Jesus, Yahweh to the rescue, does two surprising things. First, he forgives us. He forgives those who are sorry for their transgression and rebellion. The author of the law pardons repentant lawbreakers. The Apostle Paul put it most vividly in his letter to the Colossians. Christ has utterly wiped out the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments, which always hung over our heads, and has completely annulled it by nailing it over his head on the cross. And then he does a second thing. He empowers us to obey. The two things always go together, forgiveness and empowerment. How? As a human being, Jesus Christ perfectly lives the good law. Yes, we say, but he had an advantage. I mean, he's the son of God. He's God the son. True enough. The very life of God dwelt in him, enabling him to live consistent with the blueprints. But, but what does the gospel say? What happens to people who follow the son of God in discipleship and in relationship? Does he not transfer his advantage to them, to us? Yes. Yahweh to the rescue breathes his spirit into us, granting us his supernatural power to live the life of freedom. Jesus Christ overcomes the problem posed by our inability. He suffers on the cross and he sends the spirit. He forgives and he empowers us. In light of all of this, I think you can then see that in the final analysis, God's commandments turn out to be God's promises. God's word not only informs, it performs. God's word always accomplishes what it announces. And because of what God has done for us in the sending of his son and the sending of the spirit, the 10 commandments turn out to be 10 promises. I am Yahweh, your God, who made you and who became one of you and who went to the cross to free you from the consequences of your rebellious heart. I am Yahweh, your God, who comes to live with you and in you through my spirit. Therefore, because I am who I am and I have done for you what I have done, one day you will have no other gods before me. You will have no distorted images of who I am. You will not use my name in vain. You will live a holy, sabbatically oriented life. You will honor your father and mother. You will not murder. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal. You will not bear false witness. And one day you will not covet for you will be so satisfied in me. 